as you all know, and welcome to Impact DMV's virtual service. Join us for Sunday School. Visit our website for weekly lessons. We have classes for all ages. Join us on Wednesdays for prayer. Noonday prayer from 12 to 1 p.m. Corporate prayer from 7 to 8 p.m. High impact groups. Please visit our website on how to connect. Compelling conversations on WBGR with my father and my uncle G from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. every Friday. Men of Impact Virtual Connection, Friday, May 1st at 7 p.m. Please join us. And now for the birthdays. Happy birthday to Aaron Butler on April 22nd, to Shora Lewis on April 24th, Oscar Austin Jr. on April 25th, also Donna Lee Hines on April 25th, Shamar Maxwell on April 26th, Caleb Butler on April 27th, and last but not least, Dolores McQueen on May 2nd. We have four options of giving, traditional, mailing your contribution to the church, online giving at impactdmv.church, cash app at dollar sign impactdmvchurch, and text giving. Again, thank you for joining us today. Now we're entering into our service. Good morning, I'm Caleb Joyner and I'll be praying the prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I thank you for waking us up this morning. I pray that we all remain in good health. I thank you for keeping us in good health, but I pray that we all remain in good health during this pandemic. I thank you for family. I thank you for my church family. I thank you for getting us through the school year, everybody through the school year. And I uh, pray that you help everybody finish strong. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom though you've captured me. And I've got joy instead of mourning. There's beauty in my brokenness. Deep in my soul. Deep in my soul. Deep in my 
Hallelujah. Lord, receive our sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I lift up a song of worship. A song of worship. For your glory, Lord. For your glory. And your grace. And your grace. Even in the valley low. In the valley. Oh God, as I waited. As I waited. My secret place. My secret place. Lord, I will trust. I will trust. Trust in. Trust in. To you a sacrifice of praise, oh God, for you are, you were, and you forevermore will be, oh God. So we worship you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. For you are my shield. You're my shield. You're my shelter. You're my shelter. Lord, from the storm. From the storm. Oh God. You're my shelter. Oh God, in time of storm. From the storm. And from the rain. And from the rain. Lord, cover me. Cover me. Beneath the shadow of your wings, oh God. You are my higher place, oh God. Lord, receive me. A sacrifice of praise. grateful to be able to see another day. During this difficult time, we pray for all the doctors, nurses, and essential workers who are working during this crisis. Protect them. Renew their energy and encourage them during long shifts. God, we pray for our leaders in, in both federal and local government. 
Give them wisdom, give them compassion, and give our leaders in government the ability to make the right decisions for their communities, states, and country. We pray right now for healing for everyone who's in the hospital with the virus. Take away the fear they are having because they're away from their friends and family. Give them peace. We pray for anyone who, have lo who may have lost a loved one. Send the Holy Spirit and give them comfort and let your love surround them. Remember everyone in our Impact DMV Church family. Place a hedge of protection around each and every member. God, protect us from job loss, protect us from hunger, protect us from sickness, and protect us from death. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and the Holy Spirit who lives within us. We ask of all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Impact members, friends, family. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. In advance of getting started this morning, I wanted to take just a few moments and thank Dr. Lee uh, and First Lady Carmen for their commitment and dedication to Impact's virtual campus. Uh, in addition, the elders, church leadership, and the praise team for their contributions. I would also like to acknowledge Bishop and Lady Carolyn for their continued prayers and really to all of the Impact family. Thank you for uh, our Sunday nourishment. I wanted to share uh, uh, something with you guys this morning, uh, something I don't like to talk about. I, don't, I just don't talk about it often, if ever. The current climate that we find ourselves in today brings back a certain familiarity that I was sure couldn't possibly happen again. I was a flight attendant for 15 years. I had began my career with Continental Airlines in 1998. I was initially based and lived in Houston, Texas for two years. Then for seniority reasons, I transferred and moved to Cleveland. As I was approaching my third anniversary, a colleague of mine called me and asked if I would trade a trip with her. She was senior to me, meaning she was hired before I was hired, therefore her seniority afforded her partial weekends off. I jumped at the offer, traded the trips, and now I'm scheduled to fly out on Saturday. I started the three-day trip on Saturday, September 8, 2001. Scheduled to return back to Cleveland on Monday, September the 10th, 2001. And as I'm sure all of you can attest to, the airline industry can uh, be a little inconsistent at times, if you will. The last day of the three-day trip started in Los Angeles, then to Cleveland, and then the last day of the trip was what we call a uh, simple turn to New York City and back to Cleveland. When we arrived into New York on September 10th, scheduling had called ahead to LaGuardia and informed us that our flight back to Cleveland had been canceled. Well, this certainly was not a, the first cancellation <laughs> that I had experienced and unquestionably would not be the last. As routine would allow, we, the crew, went to the hotel in New York. Upon arriving to the hotel, we learned that we would be operating the first flight out in the morning of September 11th, 2001. 
after having dinner that evening with other crew members uh, that would be operating flights during or departing on September 11th later that day, we were tired for the night for preparation for our early departure at 6.30 a.m. The morning of September 11th started off just like any other work day. In fact, after takeoff from LaGuardia, I remember looking out of the window located next to the jump seat, <clears throat> thinking of what a beautiful day in New York. The skyline was spectacular. Looking downward as we were flying over Central Park, absolutely breathtaking. Nobody, nobody could have ever predicted what was about to happen. We landed at Cleveland at 7.42 a.m. After all arrival procedures were complete, I headed home. I lived about 30 minutes from the airport. And as I'm driving home, listening to the radio, full disclosure, it was not a gospel station. Uh, they had broadcast that an airplane had just hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. It was first reported that it had been a uh, news traffic helicopter or a little small airplane. Once I arrived home, I ran in and turned on the news at approximately 8.55 a.m. Eight minutes later, with the news cameras rolling live, a plane hit the South Tower. It was then evident that we were under some sort of attack. It was extremely difficult to process what I was seeing on the news. Probably because I had just left New York two and a half hours prior. And it was, such, it was such a gorgeous day. It just didn't make sense at all. I thought about the crew members who I had just had dinner with the night before, as they weren't scheduled to leave until early that afternoon. The events on September 11th completely changed how we fly today. The events on 9-11 caused mayhem to our economy, lost jobs, more importantly, loss of life. These are just a few of the parallels that we are currently facing today. And to that I say, just believe. No matter what, God has always been a soft place to land when life's roads get bumpy. The struggles we are going through now, we will overcome all of these just be strong. Our day will shine again, for the Lord has already arranged it. Stay healthy, and God bless you. Love you all. Father, once again, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together and to spend time in your word. Lord, as always, we pray that you open up our hearts and our minds, our spirits, Father, that we may receive your word with gladness today. May we learn something about your gospel today that we did not know before, and may it spring hope eternal in our hearts, Lord, and may it result in us declaring a doxological uh, statement, Father, for your glory, for your name, and for your renown, Father. Work on us right now. Make us Bereans, Lord, and we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Good morning, Impact DMV Church. It is so good to see you once again today. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Luke, the 19th chapter and the 38th verse. We're still in our teaching series, Doxology, a praise statement bubbling up from our bellies as we consider the goodness, the greatness, the power, the might, the sacrifice of our sovereign God of the universe. So that's where we're going to be spending our time today in the book of Luke. I'm going to refer to John here and there, but the bulk of our time will be spent in the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. And so let's read at, let's read our doxological statement for today. Luke 19:38. It says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, before I jump into this, there, there's something that challenges me in the book of Luke. In a few minutes, you, you understand what I'm talking about as it relates to Jesus' emotions. If you skip back one chapter in the exact same account in the book of John, though, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. 
But we have the shortest verse in the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus wept as he approaches the tomb of Lazarus. But my challenge has always been, why are you weeping when you are about to raise Lazarus from the dead? And you know you're about to do that. Why did you weep? It seems as though Jesus is emitting an emotion that is not consistent with the, the situation right before his, his eyes. Um, and, and so I, I was challenged in a similar way in the book of Luke when we have this doxological statement going forth and then reading Jesus' response to uh, that praise or that celebration uh, that was ascribed to him. And so we'll get there in a second, but I just want to point that out to you. But, but from that miracle, there were a group of people that followed him because they saw that miracle and other miracles. They, they, they recognized that there was something special about Jesus Christ and they began to follow him. Um, and, and we see this even leading into uh, what we call the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Not only were there a group of people that were following him, but the, his name had gone out. And so when people heard that he was approaching the city, a crowd came out from Jerusalem and began to celebrate him as well. Uh, and if you look at John 12 and 12, we're going to read this account before we go to the book of Luke. John 12 and 12. Um, and we're going to read the 12th through the 19th verse. It says this, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, identifying him as the one that comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. That's significant because what they are quoting there actually is coming from Psalms 118 verses 25 and 26 and this is a messianic song you got to read that whole thing go back and read it it talks about the king coming in, coming into the gates open up the gates wide for the king to enter in and this is what they are recognizing that the king of kings a king of Israel is coming into the city and they are excited at the 14th verse says and Jesus found a young ducky donkey and sat on it just as it is written the 15th verse fear not daughter of Zion behold your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt so there's a lot of recognition that's going on here the crowds they, they have identified that this guy is the son of God there's something special about this guy that's different than any prophet that we have ever encountered before and they were beginning to recognize him as being the Messiah that's why they quoted of uh, Psalms 118 and that's why they are attributing Zechariah 9 and 9 uh, the, the 16th verse says this, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about him and he had done to, and had been done to him. The 17th verse, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The 18th verse. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees, and I catch this, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Now, I wish the whole world had gone after him. Obviously, the whole world had not gone after him. If they had, they wouldn't have crucified him uh, less than a week later. Um, but in the midst of this, in the midst of all this celebration in the midst of the people recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God that there was something divine about this guy um, they are pulling in these messianic texts from the Old Testament from their scriptures Psalms 118 Zechariah 9 they're pulling in these texts and they're celebrating and praising him on a surface level it looks like Jesus is emitting 
the wrong emotion. You would think that he would be joyous. You would think that he would be happy and delighted that finally these people have recognized who I am. They are reciting Psalms 118, which is a messianic song. They are reciting Zechariah 9 and 9, which is a messianic prophecy. And you would think that he would be joyful that they finally recognize who I am, but Jesus is more subdued. And from the outside looking in, it looks like he once again is portraying an incorrect emotion. But Jesus is thinking about some things. One, this is the Passion Week. This is the week that once a year the priests would go in and they would slaughter lambs, goats, and all this to make atonement for the people. And Jesus is considering the fact that seven days later, this same group of people, less than a week later, will be yelling and screaming, crucify him, give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas instead of blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus knows all of this. Look at Luke. We're back in Luke now. Luke 41. It says, and when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he weeps over this city. He weeps again. It seems to be the wrong emotion. He weeps again. But look at the 42nd verse. It says he weeps over the city saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. He's weeping because they don't even understand what's going on here. They don't understand who he is. They're thinking that they're about to have a Messiah that's about to go to war, who's about, who's about to be a political Messiah. But this is not a political thing. What Jesus came to do was not political. It was more of a, it, not more, it was a spiritual thing. Again, all the things, all of the promises that God had made David, even all the promises that God had made Abraham, they are about to be fulfilled in the sovereign God of the universe. David's, David's horn is about to be lifted and all the energy, all right, all the prophecies, everything that has been spoken over thousands of years is about to come to its head on the horn of David in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is looking at this and he's saying that these people don't even understand what's in their midst. If you consider this week that Jesus is approaching upon, this is the Passover week. And, and what they were celebrating throughout the course of this week was being cleansed from their sins. What they were enduring was only the symbol. Jesus was the real deal. He was the substance of the symbols that they were celebrating throughout the course of that week. And I want to go to the book of Hebrews, if you would. Go to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I want to talk to you about the things that make for peace that Jesus wished that that group of people had known. And I would say that I would, I, it is my prayer that the church of the living God, that we do know these things. Um, if you go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, let's look at this for a couple of minutes. We're gonna start at the fourth verse. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when, when Christ came into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings, you have no desire, but a body have you prepared for me. In other words, all that they were going through throughout the course of that week, it only pointed to the sovereign God of the universe. Even if you read Isaiah, the first chapter, you would see that God was dissatisfied with the sacrificial system anyway. Actually, read that chapter. In one, at one point in that, verse, in that chapter, Isaiah, the first chapter, he says, who told you to trample in my courts with these animals? In other words, God, you were the one who told them to do this, but now you are expressing the fact that you are not satisfied with this. Why? Because the people kept bringing sacrifices. They kept bringing goats and bulls and turtle doves. They slaughtered them, spilled his blood. But the people didn't realize the point in all of that. 
They were supposed to look at the blood and the gore and the disgust of it all and realize that that is what their sins look like to the sovereign God of the universe and repent and cease to continue to live that way. But that's not what happened. They kept looking at the blood and the gore and, and all that. And, and they kept on just bringing God more sacrifices. Just kept bringing him more sacrifices. They never repented, not truly repented. Because after that, they just went back to the same old ways. And God has said, I'm sick of this. And so Jesus says that God was never content with that. Because the blood of bulls and goats and lamb, they can never take away our sins completely. They only covered our sins. Look at the sixth verse. It says, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, again, behold, I come. I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. The eighth verse. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These offer, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does, he does take away the first in order to establish the second. And what he's saying here, he's taken away that old sacrificial system in order to establish the new and living way through the atoning work of his son, Jesus Christ. Look at the 10th verse. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. By Jesus coming to do the will of his father. Uh, it says here that, that by that one eternal sacrifice, by that one sacrifice, we have been sanctified through the offering of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the 11th verse. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. All right? Again, expressing his discontent with the old covenant sacrificial system. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. The 14th verse is powerful and significant. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And, and he's saying, listen, that whole symbol, that whole system, Leviticus 16, it was so insufficient because it could not eradicate sin. It did not completely deal with the sin issue that humanity struggles with. But through Jesus Christ, through his one eternal sacrifice, he deals with the sin issue. And that's why Jesus on the cross declares it is finished. What was finished? God's wrath was satisfied in the goat of Leviticus 16 that was bloodlet. And secondly, our sins have been removed from us. He has taken all of that upon himself. Our sins are as far from us as the east is from the west. And it is complete done. The debt has been paid and you and I are free today. The sin issue is, is dealt with and we have been perfected forever, though we're still being sanctified. I hope you get that. We've been perfected forever. The sin issue has been dealt with, though we are still being sanctified in our practical lives. Look at the 15th verse. It says, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I would make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their heart and write them on their minds. Then he asked, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. He's saying here that the sin issue is dealt with. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he took away our sins. That's our past sins, that's our present sins, and that is our future sins. So what does this look like pragmatically? That means that when you sin today, Jesus does not run to the cross and die all over again. Your sin issue is dealt with. Let me tell you what that also means. That means that we don't have to repent any longer. Why? Because the sin issue is already taken care of. Listen. 
we repent when we come to the Lord. And when we come to the Lord and with our repentance, he washes us clean. That means he cleanses us of our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. And today, when we sin, it's an issue of confessing our sins, confessing our faults one to another. That's what we do today. We're not repenting today. Jesus is not running back to the cross. Let me show you something. Look in the book of John, John, the first chapter verses seven through nine. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's this saying? That we don't have to repent any longer. We have already repented. We've already been forgiven of our sins, but there's still some traits going on in our lives. But we don't have to go back and repent all over again because the blood is already atoned for that. Now what we do, we say about our sins what God says about our sins. No, you didn't slip into a fornication. You fornicated. You confessed that to the sovereign God of the universe and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Let, let me share something else for you. This is, this is powerful here. This goes back to what Jesus was saying about the people not knowing what made for peace. We need to know it as the covenant body that since Jesus died on the cross, we've been justified by faith and now we have peace with God. Let me show you a couple of other things. We need to continue with this for a couple of seconds because I believe that it's going to be for God's glory and your joy. We need to know the things that make for peace. Let's look at Psalms 32 and 1. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. What, what does that mean? What does it mean, whose tra blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven? Blessed, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven. What does that mean? It goes on to say, whose sin is covered. Happy is the one who realizes that his sin is covered. Look at Romans, Romans the fourth chapter. Look at Romans the fourth chapter. The fourth verse, four through eight, we're going to read this. It says, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who what? Who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted or counted as righteousness. Look at the sixth verse. He quotes David. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sins. And that's you and I, those who've been brought into the covenant, who have been brought into God's kindness. God no longer counts our sins against us, but absolutely requires for our sake more so than his. He requires that we confess our sins so we may experience the shalom, the peace, the refreshing, the times of refreshing that comes from the presence of Yeshua in our lives. Our thing is confession. Why? Because the sin issue has been dealt with. And I'm going to keep on saying that because that is the thing that makes for peace. Been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And Jesus would weep over many Christians today because they don't understand the things that make for peace. They don't understand that their sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. God's not holding that stuff against you any longer. And Jesus weeps over his people, I believe, today that don't understand that your past, present, and future sins have already been atoned for on the cross of Christ. Let's keep on going. I got, let me show you one more thing. I'm sorry. I'm getting excited about this. 
Look in Philippians, Philippians, the third chapter, the ninth verse. It says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. We receive the righteousness of God because we have put our hope, our trust, our faith in Jesus Christ. We have been cleansed from our sins. The sin issue is dealt with. And when we stumble today, we have an advocate. And that's what's happening in the heavenlies right now. There's two worlds that are going on simultaneously. We have the physical realm that we live in, but there's also the spiritual realm where the angels are, where Jesus is today. And when we sin and the, and, and the accuser of our soul goes before our Heavenly Father to identify our sin, we have an advocate. We have an advocate in Jesus Christ who stands up and says that that's covered by my blood. That's covered by my blood. And for those who think that you still need to repent, and I'm not saying this to chastise you, I just want to let you know the, the box you've put yourself in. There is absolutely no way you can repent of all your sins because we commit so many of them every single day that there's no way you can remember them all. David even understood this in the Old Testament. In Psalms 19, verses 12 to 13, he says, who can discern his errors? He says, declare me innocent from my hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And let me tell you something. That is a powerful text. And David is stating the obvious that we are finite in our thought process, in our essence, we are finite. And there's no way you're going to remember every sin you've committed. And, and therefore, you'll never be able to walk in peace. In view of everything I just communicated, now I get Jesus' emotion. I understand why he emitted the emotion of sorrow and why he wept over the city. One, the people did not understand what made for peace. Their hopes and their dreams were in a sacrificial system that never was pleasing to God and did not create true worshipers because the true worshiper understand uh, in spirit and truth the atoning work of Jesus Christ. They did not understand what he came to actually do. And so that brought forth a, a spirit of sorrow uh, within him. The second thing that I understand about the emotion that he felt they were quoting Psalms 118. And if that blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord applied to him, he also understood that verses 22 and 23 applied to him as well. Uh, I'm actually turn your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 18, 22 and 23. I want you to read this. It says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so Jesus would have known that he was the stone that the builders rejected. Why have I put the emphasis on the builders? Because the builders were the ones that were supposed to be building out the kingdom of God. The Pharisees, the leaders of the city were the ones that were supposed to be building out God's covenant. Uh, but they rejected. They did not understand their day of visitation and they rejected him. Even if you look at another little bit of Jesus, I want to call your attention to uh, Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Let's look briefly at verses 37 through 39. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. 
I think the lesson is that we cannot be about building our own kingdoms, that we have to realize that Jesus is the cornerstone. And we have to ensure that everything that God has placed in our care, that we are pointing it back to Jesus, that Jesus is the fixed foundation that everyone depends on, hopes in, trusts upon for their salvation, for their hope, for their joy. I remember hearing a narrative years ago by a preacher that I had much respect for, and he was talking about this very text about Jesus being the stone that the builders rejected. And he talks about how there was this construction going on, and uh, there was this odd stone, this odd stone, and the builders, they didn't know where that stone fits, so they just kind of tossed it as an odd stone. And upon completion of the structure, they had this one spot left. And they couldn't figure out what would fit in that one spot. And someone remembered, you know, that stone that we threw away, that stone would, would fit perfectly in this spot. And they went and got that stone and they put it in that spot and it fit uh, there uh, perfectly. And, and Jesus is that stone, the stone that the builders rejected, that is the stone that fills the gap of eternity in our souls, that which we long for, that which we hope for, that which fills all the gaps in our lives, that brings about the, the complete shalom that our souls desire. Jesus is that cornerstone that the builders had rejected. You know, I, I get it now. I understand it now based upon all the things I've already communicated. And so here we have Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Uh, they're singing these songs, these celebratory songs. They're throwing down palm leaves. Uh, they're throwing their cloaks down for the king to ride into Jerusalem on his donkey. Uh, but yet he knew they would be rejecting him soon. So here we have Jerusalem being the joy of all the earth according to uh, Psalms 48 verses 1 and 2, Jerusalem being the joy of all the earth, rejecting the joy of all the earth, being the son of the living God. Look at Luke 9 and 51. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Th this is love. He knew what was going to happen there. This is love beyond measure. He knew he was going to be crucified, but for the joy that was set before him, because he knew that the thing he was about to do was going to make for your peace, was going to make for my wholeness, was going to make for our shalom, that it was going to satisfy God's righteous demand, because it was going to remove the sin from us and allow us to walk in the shalom of God for God's glory and for our ultimate joy. He set his face to go to Jerusalem and he was crucified for the joy that was set before him. This is love, love that transcends anything that I could imagine. The songwriter said, amazing love, what could it be that a king would die for me? And that's what has happened, that the son of the living God, the sovereign king has died for you and I, and now we can sing doxological songs to that king because we walk in freedom, we walk in joy. Our sins are not being counted against us. We, God has taken care of our sin debt, our past, our present, and our future debt. And you and I are free today because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So blessed is the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us partake of Jesus' broken body and shed blood for us together.
Father, we thank you for the finished work that you did on the cross through Jesus' blood. You did it all for us, O oh God, and we are so grateful and we are blessed. Thank you for this time that we have together as brothers and sisters to share in communion. Amen. Let me close out with Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power with his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, all the fullness of God. Bow your heads if you would. Father, I thank you today that your son has come to the earth. Blessed is the, blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for that coming, Father. And I pray today, Lord, that we will know, Lord, the things that make for peace, your extreme love for your people. May we know that today and may doxological statements spring forth from our belly as we consider your atoning work. Glory to God. God, Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.